tanto è la nostra keynote quanto voi. Vi ricordo che dentro alle cartelline c'è un QR code, un codice da inquadrare se volete fare domande eh, tramite questa piattaforma sly.do. Potete fare domande, quindi anche se non vi va di mettere il nome che siete da fare ai relatori, noi le raccoglieremo e le presenteremo alla fine della, eh, della sessione. È più facile che poi gestire le domande e eh, così. Eh, so I want to introduce you Atina Salaba and uh, she's professor of the, of the School of Information of the Kent State University in Ohio. And she is also the chair of the Subject Analysis and Access uh, ICLA section. Uh, and she's also a member of the BCM Review Group. And, uh, and she's also the treasurer of the ISCO. Eh, eh, Atina Salaba è eh, docente alla eh, School of Information della Kent State University in Ohio, poi è la chair del gruppo IFLA che si occupa proprio del subject analysis and access, quindi tutto quello che riguarda eh, l'accesso di natura semantica, ma è anche un membro del gruppo che adesso si chiama BCM, quindi del gruppo dei modelli concettuali, l'ex gruppo FRDR. E infatti nelle sue riflessioni, nei suoi studi, mette insieme questi due aspetti, cioè quello delle riflessioni sulla semantica e quello dei modelli concettuali. Quindi diciamo un'elaborazione un teorica molto, eh, molto complessa. Eh, lascio la parola ad Atina e la ringrazio ancora. And so, thank you Atina. Thank you. I'll stand for a minute <laughs> so everybody can see me. Um, my name is Athena Salaba, as Agnes has said. Um, I would like to thank Agnes first because she was um, the one that I talked to in, in inviting me, but also the whole uh, program committee and everyone else. Um, Uh, as, as I expected, everybody is very, very welcoming and warm in a cool place, right? Yes, <laughs> this is going to be the coolest conference uh, <laughs> in um, both the uh, meetings. Um, so uh, then I will start with my uh, presentation. I want to just say that I was in the PCM after eight years. They kick you out. And you can't stay longer than no. Years. I will apologize for not being able to speak. Italian. I only can keep two languages at a time. The other ones go away. <laughs> so right now I speak English and Greek. So I will do English for you. <laughs> um, and um, if I speak too fast, say stop, <laughs> go slower. I'm Greek, so I do like Italians do, speak fast and use my hands. <laughs> But uh, for the rest of it, I might sit down so you can see the screen here because my head is probably in the middle of it. <laughs> um, so I will do that. It's kind of strange for me. I usually speak standing. <laughs> I usually speak moving. So, moving, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, a little bit about what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to give some introduction as a background information. Then I will be a little bit theoretical uh, about uh, subject indexing of non-textual materials, and I will use Panofsky's and Sutford's uh, theories. Then I will do a little bit of exploration um, through some cases of non-textual materials, and I will talk a little bit about ethical considerations. I will not talk about specific standards or practices or guidelines of how to index. It's not a how to thing. It's more of a questions than answers. <laughs> so um, background, um, our collections in the libraries have been still, I mean, there were always textual materials, but still largely textual materials. Uh, that we have. Although we um, seen that we have significant changes in what we are collecting and what we're providing access to or what our users want to access. Um, we always set maps in the collections for music or film, especially if libraries have archival collections, then there is other types of materials that we have. Uh, but with um, the exponential growth of the web, um, we saw that there is an increase of materials 
um, that became available uh, to us in digital form, whether that is born digital or converted digitized collections. And that was also the time that a lot of digital libraries, separate projects started um, uh, to um, take off. Um, and also museums at the time realized that they weren't as unique. I mean, the objects are unique, but how you describe and index things is not as unique. So they started um, having more of international standards and metadata, but also started sharing their collections through the web by using surrogates of the objects that they have in order to kind of share with the world what they collect. Um, Public libraries, especially in many areas of the world, um, started um, using um, a diversity of resources um, the, and they become a place where they have different kinds of services, not the traditional services that we had in public libraries. So we see that in addition to text, sound, still and moving images, uh, public libraries are becoming places for creativity, but also entrepreneurship. So we see an increase of what we call it in the United States, and I don't know if that's here too, the library of things. So, and um, academic libraries are starting to have similar collections, but more limited, not as much as public libraries, because academic libraries um, have, are limiting their collections to support curriculum and to support the research of the institution. So a little bit about Library of Things. Um, they are non-traditional collections um, and not always are for research. Um, they are often for uh, personal use, the creativity, the exploration, or maybe um, things they need to do at home. Um, so they are kind of specialized collections and they, the first ones that we heard about was actually collections of cake pans. Do you know what cake pans are? So if you have little kids at home and they need birthday cakes, one year they need a uh, Spongebob, the next year they want a train. So libraries started having cake pan collections mm -hmm. so people can just use it one time and then the next time something else. Uh, and eventually it became all kinds of things. So they, they support arts and crafts. So they have sewing machines. If you want, you can go borrow a sewing machine and make a dress. Um, they have electronics and tools. You can go and get a camera if you're going for vacation and you can get a laptop if that's what you want. During COVID, that was the main thing, laptops and hot um, spots, so internet. So they can have that. Um, they have musical instruments. If you don't want to spend a lot of money while your children or yourself want to learn something, you go borrow that from the library and, and that's what it is. So there's all kinds of things. Gardening, seed libraries are very, very, um, to, to promote people pla using plants. I know you don't have that problem in Italy, <laughs> <laughs> but they are. So they're tools. You, you need a drill or something else. So those are things that we see a lot of public libraries that I have now, but also academic libraries like cameras and video cameras. Students want to go and do a project, right? They need other types of materials. What we see in these collections is that the indexing is very basic, if not just Sandra. Um, so it's mostly indexing that um, helps with collection management um, and um, circulation, to manage the circulation, not really subject indexing or anything else. Um, so, and we see that the terminologies are typically keywords that they use. Um, and although there are some specialized vocabularies like the University of North Texas has a whole their own vocabulary for Zandra terminologies for such things. So I'm not going to cover those as much as fun as they are, but it's mostly as an awareness that in the future, our collections will be very different and our indexing needs will be very different. Okay, so what makes indexing for non-textual resources different? And I'm going to use indexing of images often, but I mean all the non-textual, so it's easier to use that. Um, the first thing that is different is that when we are indexing non-textual uh, uh, materials, we use text, so textual descriptions, uh, to um, create interpretations of what 
our own um, experiences of the image. So we look at the image and we kind of have an idea of what it is and then we use we convert it into text to describe what that is. And the end users, the people that are searching for that information are using the same process. They are converting their vision of this image into text, right? So there are some uh, challenges in that because when we use word, um, it's usually uh, meaning by convention. So we all know what the word means. So we have a common understanding of what this meaning of the word is. But when we're looking at a picture, uh, it's a surrogate of a projection, which is something that we understand as different, and then we translate it into the word, which means that the meaning is not necessarily the same as when we use words. Um, information that we have from non-textual materials, of course, is limited or it's not available at all. And um, it requires a lot of interpretation. Uh, a lot of interpretation means different interpretation. So each of us might interpret uh, what something is about when it's non-textual, even in textual, but especially in non-textual, very differently, which means that introduces uncertainty and ambiguity. And then there is the question of neutrality. We as librarians want to think that we are neutral or objective when we describe that, but that is not the case when it comes to non-textual materials, right? So is there really neutrality when we index something? Um, or objectivity. Um, when we do index uh, non-textual materials, we usually think of the offness, the aboutness, and the isness. Those are the different aspects that we're looking at. Um, our knowledge organization systems are not always designed for non-textual materials. So we often use, if we use the general subject vocabularies, they are based on what we call literary warrant. A literary warrant looks at what the texts say, and that's how our vocabularies are created. So our vocabularies are not necessarily, the general vocabularies are not necessarily designed or adequate to um, do indexing of non-textual materials. They could be helpful in general topics, but they don't have the aspects of the, or the facets that we need to represent when we have non-textual materials. Also, it's a very, um, uh, an area where a lot of tagging is used and a lot of Zandra terminologies are used versus the specific subject indexing. Although we have seen um, knowledge organization systems that are created for art or for images. For example, the Getty vocabularies are the most general ones for, art, uh, for works of art. Um, we have the museums have the vocabulary that's called the museum nomenclature. So they are things that are specialized. Um, so a little bit about the offness, aboutness, and isness. So is is what it is physically or intrinsically. Typically, the Zendra terms are used for that. Off is what is depicted, what we see when we look at an image or an object of art. And about, of course, is the stories, uh, the subject matter, and that's where the interpretation comes. Um, mm -hmm. And some say that it's impossible really to express what is symbolized in one medium using another medium or using the language. So it's difficult to kind of take an object and express what it is in, in words. Um, users typically, um, when they think of non-textual materials, they think both of offness and aboutness. Um, so if you take a very, and I will take this example um, uh, throughout here, which is, this is an image of an actual object. So I'm using the image as the surrogate now to talk about the actual object. Um, so isness would be, when we look at this, it's a sculpture or a monument. Uh, offness is we know that this sculpture is of a man. Um, and if we know a little bit about uh, history or, or the object is about Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and the aboutness then, knowing a little bit about Martin Luther King is about civil rights and racial equity. So there is an interpretation in the aboutness that is required. Um, so 
we use a lot the terms iconography and iconology, and I will talk about those terms quite a bit, but initially I want to give you the basic definitions of that. Iconography is from the Greek icon, which means image, um, and um, graphy, which is to write. <laughs> so it is really describing what, what uh, the image is, uh, what we see. It's the first interpretation of an image. Mm -hmm. Iconology on the other uh, side is uh, the science that studies the objects through origin, um, through the resources that talk about what is the, in the image, um, and it's a result of an interpretation. So let's talk a little bit theoretical here. Um, So Panofsky um, is known for his theory of um, the iconolog iconological, can I speak? It's too early. <laughs> Method, actually, it's like 2 a.m. for me or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, the iconological method. Um, so this, uh, he's known for this uh, iconography theory, and he's known for saying that everything has symbolic value. Anything in the world has some symbolic value. And that using iconological interpretation, we can reach intrinsic meaning. Uh, which um, it's what the context is, the meaning of, of something else. The term iconology uh, wasn't first introduced by Panofsky, it was actually used, uh, introduced by Warburg, which, who was a German um, art historian. So this comes from the art history environment. But Panofsky uh, developed it into um, a theory. So according to, uh, and Panofsky, I should say, is not a librarian, did not talk about indexing. This was just for an art history uh, uh, perspective, but, but we, because of the terminology is helping us with subject indexing, it has been then used as a theoretical framework for subject indexing of non-textual um, materials and a lot of um, museum uh, indexing really it uses this terminology and his theories to start about thinking about the indexing. Um, so he um, defined three levels of meaning in artworks um, and started with, uh, to explain his theories, he started with this example of uh, a man um, raising his hat. So he says that at the first level, when we first look at, uh, at this, uh, all we see is a man raising a hand right, a hat, um, but in, in, and that's pretty much in iconographic uh, perspective, that is an action and uh, we, can, we can see this action uh, happening. But when we look at under the uh, iconological, when we start making the interpretation, uh, then we have, we see that there is some meaning in this gesture, right? So the meaning is that we assume that there are at least two people not just one, <laughs> there are at least two people and uh, involved in this. And the first person is the one that is doing the action and the other person is um, the one that sees the action. And this means, and if you're familiar then with the Western culture, right? So maybe not everywhere in the world this is that has meaning, but in the Western culture, there's some meaning because we know that this is a gesture of friends, a friendliness of, or respect. Um, so to reach this understanding, we need the cultural understanding of what this, this gesture means, right? And often we, we need some knowledge of the social norms. So in the museum environment, these theories have been uh, used and, uh, and it says that there are three levels, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more of the three levels. The first one is that we just see the act, the, the, the facts and the expressions, right? That's the primary meaning. In the second level, which is iconography, we identify and describe the subject matter, the images we see. And in the third one, we do the interpretation and that's where the symbolism, the value of the symbolism comes through. So if we look through the examples uh, of each level, um, uh, and again, this is a surrogate, right? So in the first level, which is also called the primary or natural, we answer the question, what, right? What do we see? And it, it just, all it needs is, is, is a natural perception, what we see. 
And we see a statue, it's a sculpture. We see that it's made out of stone. Yes, you don't see it here, but if you're there, you see that it's out of stone. We see that it, it depicts a man holding a rolled piece of paper. And we also, uh, but we don't know what the meaning is. What is the message? All we see is it's a man. In the secondary or conventional uh, level, which is called a iconographic, we answer the first question that is what, but we add the who, when, and where. Uh, so that will need a little bit more um, knowledge of the culture. Uh, so it's not any man, but it's Martin Luther King Jr. Um, we know that he was a civil um, rights activist, um, mid 50s to late 60s. Um, we know that he had a very famous speech <laughs> and we know that this um, statue is in Washington DC in the United States. The third level now, which is called the tertiary or intrinsic, it's the iconology. We add to the questions what, who, when, where, the why and how. And that's where we need additional knowledge. It could be personal knowledge, cultural knowledge. Um, we might need to consult resources that talk about the person depicted or the monument. Uh, we also need to have the historical, social, and cultural interrelations in order to be able to interpret what this is about. So we find, we know about Martin Luther King's legacy. Uh, we understand that this is a symbolism for racial equality, for the working class and the oppressed world. And we know that the way this is done for the artist, it's, a st it's called the Stone of Hope or the Mountain of Despair. And if you can see, it's, it was a piece of stone and out of the piece of stone, half of it came out and it's projecting out. That has a lot of symbolism. Um, about his speech that he came out of the stone and he's progressing out with the marks and everything else. So you kind of need to know the history and everything else to understand uh, what this means and how to uh, represent it. So a little bit of summary of what Panofsky's theory says uh, that pro was provided by the literature later on. Again, he wasn't talking about subject analysis. So later on, what we know is that uh, in order to understand the meaning of, of an image, it requires to have correct uh, iconographical description and connect, uh, correct iconographical analysis. So we need to have correct in the first steps of what is depicted in order to understand what it is about. Um, the iconographical analysis focuses on the stories and the themes, uh, which are derived from the first um, uh, description. And then the interpretation requires knowledge and ability that makes sense. So the first level becomes from, it comes out of the visualizing what it is, what we see, but the rest of it, we identify and contextualize and interpret. Now in, uh, as I said, Panofsky's theory with the three levels uh, was uh, specific to the world of art history. Uh, but Sanford was the one that took these theories and expanded them to the library science and subject indexing of non-contextual um, resources. Um, and and to, uh, how to analyze pictorial work to, for subject indexing. Uh, C said that um, it's actually, when you think about it, only the first and second <laughs> levels that we um, index uh, because the third level requires too much of subjective critical review in order to figure out what exactly is an interpretation. Uh, but in the literature, we know that aboutness is also um, very important. Um, so she also introduced this uh, generic and specific le levels of description. So in the first level that we look at facts and expressions and we can have a generic descriptions of or we can have aboutness. This first level can, of description can also be an, anyone who is um, familiar with Eleanor Ross. The basic level uh, description is what we understand as the common uh, views of what the image is looking like. It's very objective uh, indexing, right? What we are looking at. Um, in the third level, the, the subject is 
we can have different interpretation of what something is depending on our culture and our experiences and our knowledge of the topic. Um, this means that we have lower indexing consistency. So when I look at something in an indexing, a non-textual resource might come up with different index terms than when somebody else with different experiences look at it or from different culture. Uh, which means that uh, this is where we see differences in indexing and difficulties in indexing because we don't have high indexing consistency. Um, so Stanford says that um, when we look at this, um, then uh, one person may think that it's something about something and then another pe person looks at it and says it's about something totally different. Um, so Sanford, uh, Sadford says that we are looking at four questions, the who, what, where, and when. So notice the high and why is not in her model, <laughs> um, but it also has the aspects of the generic of and the specific of. So the example C used was the bridge. So you can look at something and it's a bridge, or you can look at something and it's the Brooklyn Bridge. And in our example, we looked at something and it was a man, the generic of, but the specific of was Martin Luther King Jr., right? So in all these levels, we look at the specific and the generic and then the about. What does it mean when you look at that specific man? What is it behind the man, right, that we're looking at? Um, so at the minimum, she says that we should have both the generic of and specific of when we are indexing something. So we should say that it's about a man, but it's also about the specific man. So you can provide access to both levels, to both aspects. Um, but there are also a threshold of details. How much detail can you give in indexing? Um, there are some critics that say that Panofsky's theory is really based on um, the hierarchical structure and the very Eurocentric views of how we interpret things and how we provide the symbolism or describe the symbolism of arts. Um, and therefore, what might make sense to a Eurocentric view of, of uh, interpretation might not make sense to other um, cultures of when they look at that. So continuing with uh, uh, Sadford, she also came up with four uh, types of attributes that we can use to uh, categorize or describe images. The biographical, subject, exemplified, and relationship. The most difficult one would be the subject. Um, and she also talked about the generic and specific, which has four facets, time, space, activity or event, and the object. The biographical is like a biography of image. Who made it? When was it made? Um, the exemplified is attributes that tells us what type of kind it is, what example of that's where the Sandra <coughs> terminologies come into play. Um, the subject are the meaning, so it's the aboutness really, and very subjective and can be generic and specific. And relationships are very important in um, non-textual materials because the, the relationships give us the context for the interpretation. So it, it relationships to other images, to objects or texts that describe the event, if the image is of an event. Um, so it is important to not only record relationships, but also the nature of the relationship when we are describing non-textual um, resources. So a little bit of exploration through cases, and I get, and I said it's going to be more questions than answers on this one. Um, so now that we, we talked a little bit about the theoretical, the different types of offness, isness, aboutness that we represent, and the challenges of interpretation uh, and symbolism, um, let's see if this theory is called in the different kinds of um, resources. So I'm going to talk again images, and I'm talking about images in general. Red is my favorite color, so here it is. <laughs> so images can be works of art, they can be uh, illustrations, photographs, anything. They can be analog, they can be digital, they can be surrogates of something else. Uh, and they are available, that's the majority of non-textual resources that we have. There is a lot of images. 
Um, and most of our literature, when we talk about non-textual indexing, are actually focusing on images. There is very, there is very little on other types of um, resources that we're describing. Um, so what are some of the challenges in image and video indexing? Um, there is very little structural and semantic information available with them. They don't come with information, right? Um, and of course, we need to use language. We need to extract some information in order to uh, um, meaningfully describe them and interpret them. Um, we need to have a high level understanding of what the object is, the scene, and the semantic uh, levels. Um, and there are different facets that we can describe. So there's not simple aboutness, there's no simple um, description, but we have to decide which facets we are um, describing. There are multiple interpretation possible, which means again, inconsistency in how we describe them, error, inaccuracies of what we're describing. And very often they are indexed at a minimum, um, which is not uh, necessarily um, helpful for retrieval. So when a user wants to find images, it's not as, uh, even in Google Images, that's supposed to be great. <laughs> it's, it's always uh, inadequate when we are searching for images because the information and the indexing behind is not as detailed or as extensive as we do with text. Um, our retrieval tools are not there yet. It's not, it, you can't search for images unless you use words. Right. I mean, there is the image search, uh, but it, it's not in our systems. Right. Uh, so our retrieval tools are not good at searching images. Um, one of the areas that really is not very often um, talked about is images that are used as illustrations within text. So when we are indexing text that have illustrations, we rarely index the images that are in there, the illustrations that are in there. The illustrations are there because they have meaning. Like we say, you know, a, a, a picture is like a thousand words, <laughs> um, but it's often uh, ignored in indexing uh, when we index a text. They are considered maybe unimportant because the text maybe explains what they mean, but that's not always the case. Um, and um, it's, it's uh, unknown of how much you can say about that image that is also with, with the text. And it's interesting that um, sometimes when um, there was a researcher that asked the publishers about indexing of um, images when they do the indexing of the book, and they said, oh, no, we tell the editors to ignore them. Um, mm -hmm. Why would you put that in the index? Right. So they are ignored as not important because the text becomes more the primary, the more important part. Um, the other case I wanted to kind of use is the historic photographs. Um, mostly when we look at the historic photograph, we describe the object, the people and the activity or the, the, the place. Um, but it's very um, interesting to, when we look at images sometimes, when we look at text, we, we look at the authorial intent for indexing. So what did the author intend to mean or to, to convey? What's the message the author is? Um, so is it easy to uh, figure out what the photographer's intent was for this? Um, more often the photographer's intent is ignored because they are considered documentary um, um, in nature. So the event is more important than the intent of the photographer, why they took this uh, picture. So then what is the focal um, topic of the subject? Um, usually to figure out the focal point of this picture, the documentary pictures, is, is coming out of other resources, either the, the collections context. So in archive, if you have a set of pictures, there's a collection of pictures, you figure out what the pictures are about by the context, by the collection, or by other materials that came with the pictures or the resources that you use. Um, typically, we look at recognizable scenes, and that becomes the focus of what can all of us recognize? And um, usually we think about what the users will be asking, what a user is looking at this and would, would look for that um, uh, image, which means that we have to have a consensus or a common understanding of what this image is about. 
So it's kind of difficult, again, when you look at images to come up with a common understanding of what this is about. Um, in looking at what we decide to index, sometimes in, in this type of um, pictures, we, we look at um, the quality of the image and the uniqueness of the image in order to index them. So if you have a big set of pictures, would you index them all? And what would you index? Depends on the quality of the image, but also how unique the image is. Um, and um, when we look at professional indexers and taggers, means the people that go and tag um, the images, we see that um, both offness uh, and aboutness is important for the users. Um, and often the tags that are provided are more useful uh, than the indexing terms that the professional is using when we are looking at those. And one of the things that we look at this historical photographs is the free text that is included in describing the image that's more useful to understand what the image is about than the terms that we use in the indexing. So professional indexing is not very good when it comes to documentary uh, photographs is what the literature is telling us. Um, the other one that I wanted to look is cartoons. Um, the cartoons are usually a subject matter that is a commentary on political or social issues. We see them everywhere, every day in the internet, they're all over the place. Um, they often come with some text. Um, so it's a combination of image and text. Um, I can never get what they mean. <laughs> That's my personal thing. <laughs> I look at them and it's totally different. My husband looks at a cartoon and laughs and I'm like, what's funny? I don't, I don't, get <laughs> so I don't get them, <laughs> which means that it's difficult then to figure out what something is about when, um, when it's more of a commentary on a political situation. There is an implied message that the visual is not necessarily representing it. So it's always there is something behind it that is totally different than the message that it is. Uh, and, and therefore, often it's not accurately represented. Um, what the artist is implying, can the user understand it, is the question. So how, how do we match those two? And they are context dependent, right? Often they're thought as also historical documents because they are representing something at a particular time that is of a context of a political or social issue. So they are sort of like historical documents, uh, but they are also time sensitive because they are about a specific topic. If you look at this in an archival collection 50 years later, would you understand or would you have the same understanding? Because the context is changing and history happens. So we have more interpretation and other things. Or maybe if we forgot what that was all about back then. So, and controversy is actually um, used often for controversies. So they, they have a lot of debate. They, they, they make us debate about things. And we look at it in this debate. Um, so describing something that might be controversial might be difficult because, again, we're trying to describe objectivity. We don't want to put the interpretation of what one side says versus the other side says for the same political issue, um, which then means that we don't do adequate indexing because we are trying to be objective, which means that we only do the very basic interpretation of what a cartoon might uh, mean. Uh, maps. We always said maps. Uh, maps tend to be um, both um, text and images. Um, so there is the main top. The main topic is that the, the geographic area that is represented in a map. There is a lot of indexing that happens about the technical and the graphic features of a map. So we don't really think about aboutness. What is the map about? <laughs> um, and do we need then? Does it? Does the issue of interpretation come to play when we are indexing maps? Is the question. Um, but if you think about it, when we have a map uh, that has both image and text, and you take the text away, the map makes. It, it's like what is this, right? If you don't have the labels and the the, the street names or whatever, you have no idea, it could be any place. 
Um, and if you just have the list of the names or the street names or whatever the legend has and not imagery, then those don't make sense either. We don't we don't know what that is. So it, it's um, looking at the different uh, indexing both of what is this map about? Is it for creational use? What is the use? It's what the features and everything else. But ne not necessarily interpretation because there's not meaning behind it. No, no. Um, I, intrinsic meaning behind them. When we look at video, film, and TV programs, um, we see again that um, we have a combination of, of linguistic content and the visual content uh, in them. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the linguistic content might help us with the indexing, uh, but again, there's a translation of what it is about. Um, we've seen a lot of learning videos in our collections uh, today for libraries. Um, and I have three um, public libraries in the United States provide access to Canopy and Hoopla. Those are like uh, collections of, of videos that are more educational and um, can learn about ancient history or about the stars or uh, things like that or recreational too. Um, a lot of movies that were novels uh, are in them. No indexing. I mean, if you look at them, there's no indexing. There may be some tags, keywords, but that's about it. The same is with YouTube. Everybody uses YouTube to do something, right? You learn about things in YouTube. And YouTube, again, has no indexing. So um, we see that in this visual content that there's a lack of indexing in the aboutness. Um, again, we look at technical and special features uh, that are in these types of materials, the Zenra, but we need to think about this psychological and sociological context. A lot of the times what users want is what emotions does it convey? Or is it a happy movie? Or is am I going to cry at the end? <laughs> you know, is it going to be suspense and it's going to be thriller and going to be scared? Or other things of um, is it going to um, uh, make me think about the world and question things, or does it have it from this aspect or that aspect? So there's a lot of things that we don't represent in the aboutness that usually these visual resources have. Music is very similar. Uh, we can have sound, we can have notation or sound and words together, but a lot of the times the words are not helping us necessarily to figure out what the song is about, right? Uh, it, it's more creative um, and there's different interpretations of what something is about. Um, we often do Zandra, very easy to classify by the Zandra um, and the technical and musical characteristics. But again, we have the psychological and sociological context, the cultural context, right? If it's Latin music, it's very different than the other music. And it's just not the Zandra, but it's also the meaning behind it, the emotions that they create, the understandings of history or the time they were created uh, that we're missing. The other question is the versions. Are they the same when it's the same song, but it's done differently by different artists? Is, is that, does that create different emotions? Does that create different meaning behind us? And I have the, um, I, I, I love Le, uh, Leonard Cohen, Hallelujah, has been sung by hundreds and hundreds of people, used in movies, used in all kinds of different contexts. Its context makes it sound a little bit different and gives a different emotional reaction and interpretation of what this song is about. So that's something to kind of need to think about when we are indexing. How much of the subjective interpretation are we represented or are we just using the objective um, description of what it is? A little bit about knowledge organization systems. As I said initially, most of our general knowledge organization uh, systems are designed for textual resources. They are, they are not considered as um, adequate for the interpretation uh, and the intrinsic meaning of non-textual resources. But um, And we have a few special knowledge organization systems, but they are not that widely used or they are not as many as, as the resources the types of resources that we have. Um, we tend to rely mostly on genre terminologies for these types of resources, which again does not talk about the uh, subject indexing of these resources. And I have the list of the Getty vocabularies are the ones that are the most uh, 
complete set and what more wider works of art than specialized types of work of uh, art. Um, they are specialized knowledge organization systems and they are what we call empirical um, uh, knowledge organization systems. A lot of the time what we are using is localized or application specific. So we create a digital library, we're going to put resources there, we're going to create a set of keywords or a set of terms, control terms that we're going to use for that particular context, which is application specific. Um, and again, I'm going to put the user tagging here because that's what we see that we have more indexing and more a variety of aspects are presented when we use tagging, but are they reliable? Do they actually represent their botness? And are they representing the personal experience, the personal interpretation? Um, so are they really good for uh, retrieval? I'm not going to talk about automatic subject indexing other than there is there. And I know that uh, there will be a presentation using an F4 um, indexing images. So most uh, of automated subject indexing work has been done for text. Again, easy for machine to, to use and, and analyze text. Um, we've done it with natural language processing and other areas. There is um, progress, a lot of progress for textual indexing, but not so much for images, videos, music, etc. Uh, for And again, I think mostly it's, um, we lack the textual uh, context um, and also there is the issue of interpretation. So machine does, is not so good in interpreting things. Um, a lot of automated indexing is done using semi-automatic indexing, which means that they rely on a vocabulary and also organization system to kind of index things. So depending on the vocabulary you're using as your, your base, then you have to the, introduce the issues of the vocabulary in that. And again, the aboutness is going to be difficult for a machine to figure out because of the interpretation. Um, ethical considerations. It's a big thing in the research areas uh, in the last uh, uh, decade or so. Um, because, of course, we are talking about interpretations, then we know that objectivity and neutrality uh, of librarianship and subject indexing is a false assumption. So there is always, no matter how objective we want to be, there is also always the subjective, which introduces biases. Um, that could be biases of the individual, our knowledge, our background, our beliefs are introduced in them, but biases in the vocabulary. Um, there's a big um, area of research on the colonial perspective that's uh, introduced in our vocabularies and that's why because they are textual based on the literary warrant who was able to publish a lot the western world <laughs> what we do in our collections <laughs> what are our vocabularies based on it's very eurocentric western american views in the vocabularies so and that is the colonial perspective Right, um, and that comes both in the terminologies we use, how we label things, but also in the classification, where we put things, under what hierarchy we put things. So we're looking at classification of Dewey, for example, and you um, see that certain um, topics uh, like the Roma or immigrants or topics like that are under social issues, as if it's a problem, right, of society. So again, the colonial perspective in the classification is, is uh, evident. We also have algorithmic bias. So the machine is trained by humans to do certain things and they are using that. Or the machine is using the knowledge organization system to base the indexing and therefore the bias of the knowledge organization system is there. The machine is using a set of documents a set of images to learn how to index it's biased by that set that we gave it um, there is the representation of identity how we identify individuals uh, not how they identify themselves but how we what we use to identify the individuals but also the groups whether as ethnic groups cultural groups racial or socioeconomic uh, groups 
Um, so a lot of our literature is looking at the critical theory and practice and how that applies in subject indexing in text, but also in images. Images are very, very significant in how we see our world. So the practice of looking at the image and what we say it's about, um, is it about black women or is it the culture? Is it about the dance? Is it about other things? So the, our views might be very limited because we are um, looking at from our perspective. Um, so those are some of the things that we have to think. It's not just simple objectivity, but the, the subjective is also always coming into play where we're indexing non-traditional, uh, non-textual materials. How are we time? I think I'm about that. If you want a few more, Matthew. Uh, so I'm gonna end probably with a couple quotes. Um, so the first one uh, comes from uh, Clanzen and Rico, I think. <laughs> um, from the article, it's called "Librarian Cornered by Images: Or How to Index Visual Resources." I like the quote. Uh, the the uh, article is very basic, introducing some uh, issues. But the quote says, "Unfortunately, very often we are unable to name and express what is important, unique, and original in this vision, meaning the vision of the artist when they created the image. Its sense remaining inaccessible or unexpressed." We are going to try to enumerate general and secondary elements of a picture, but the highest level of meaning would remain sometimes inaccessible. Does it mean that Im images indexers attempts are doomed to fail? We hope not. Mm -hmm. And the next one is um, more about the public libraries and what they offer. Um, what we are seeing now, last year's highly touted New York Public Library Upload is an excellent example. They put a lot of um, digital content in their library and provide access. Is a search of digital information from all corners of the world, finding a place in huge online virtual repositories, libraries, and archives. As one would expect, given the history of digital humanities, many of the largest digital repositories in the world reside on university servers, are now making billions of digital files freely accessible to the public. Quality indexing for intelligent and easy access to all these digital files is important than, more important than ever. So those are my two quotes as a concluding remarks. <laughs> and thank you very much.